from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And in our lineup today, K-State's Jeff Whitworth reporting on widespread insect concerns in Kansas grain sorghum stands currently led by an outburst of chinch bugs. He'll talk about why making control decisions for those and for sorghum headworms aren't as clear-cut as you growers might like. Also, K-State's Lucas Haig will discuss controlling weeds on harvested wheat ground here in late summer and how that favorably impacts dryland corn and sorghum yields on those acres the following year. He'll cite the extensive K-State research on that subject. And K-State's Charlie Lee talks about proposed improvements to zinc phosphide as a rodent control product commonly used in agricultural settings. All this and more next on Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and thanks for listening in on this Tuesday. Well, we are rapidly heading into the pivotal time for grain sorghum stands in Kansas to begin squaring away their yield potential. And so, naturally, there are select insects that are working on that crop as well. What's out there and what to do about those infestations, our topic now. Joining us via phone from the field where he's conducting insect control trials as we speak, Jeff Whitworth, crop entomologist, K-State Research and Extension. And Jeff, routinely you say you're getting word from growers about insect problems they're spotting in their stands. And one of the primary ones would be the chinch bug, which you say is reportedly more than a little abundant out there. Yes, uh, that's true. Good morning, Eric. You know, the sorghum around the state, uh, it's in various stages of development. There's some pretty young sorghum uh, yet, I think, that's pretty stressed, um, you know, and I don't know if it's young just because of the heat and drought and it's not growing too much or it was late planted or a combination thereof, but there's some sorghum also that's looking pretty good and is at the soft dose stage. But in either case, there are a lot of chinch bugs, and we've been talking about chinch bugs, you know, ever since the spring, and the chinch bug situation is getting worse, the environmental conditions for chinch bugs are ideal. We have hot, dry conditions. Now, we have a lot of humidity, and that's one of the questions I've been getting is we thought when the humidity was relatively high, that would promote the fungus because there's a a fungus bavaria uh, that in some years will actually decimate chinch bugs. Uh, A couple years ago, it came through. It's the same one that decimated green clover worms and soybeans. So the spores are always out there. The humidity is pretty high, but I don't think that's getting down into the base of the plant or down around the ground where it is still relatively dry. And, and these chinch bug populations, right now they're in mixed stages. It's, there's a lot of little tiny red nymphs still hatching out. There's adults that are still mating, which means they're going to be ovipositing, which means these chinch bug populations are going to continue to increase for the foreseeable future, really. And the sorghum, even if it's looking pretty good right now, if you have a lot of chinch bugs around the base of the plant, it's still drying out those stalks because the chinch bug, they suck the juice out of the plant. And I don't think a lot of growers are noticing it, but they're starting to weaken these stalks. A lot of stalks were just starting to lean a little bit, and they're starting to look a little prematurely dry. So uh, in years past, we've seen chinch bugs at this stage, especially if we don't get, oh, you know, maybe an inch or two of rain about weekly or every 10 days or so. These stalks are going to continue to dry out, and then we'll have some lodging. But even if that doesn't occur, they can reduce grain film just because they're intercepting a lot of the moisture that the plant needs to put in the developing kernels. So if they're not out in the middle of the field yet, if they're mostly around the the borders of the field, they're going to start moving 
to more succulent plants, and as eggs hatch and more chinch bugs come along, they're also going to move around and infest plants that maybe haven't been as heavily infested yet. Well, given that, then, knowing how to approach controlling chinch bugs and sorghum would seem somewhat challenging, if not daunting. Yes. Number one, if you treat, if it's still pretty small sorghum, if the sorghum's, you know, maybe knee-high or maybe not yet quite waist-high, you can put drop nozzles on and go spray around the base, make sure that spray gets around the base of the plant because those chinch bugs will be in the soil around the base of the plant or they'll be behind the leaf sheets. Uh, where that insecticide just really has a hard time getting to them. And I keep reminding everybody, these are contact insecticides, so they have to actually contact the chinch bug. Now, if the plants are a little bit larger than that or you don't have drop nozzles, pull your sprays just don't, they're just not going to penetrate down to where those chinch bugs are. And, you know, I, we keep telling everybody if you use a foliar spray with a conventional chemical insecticide, uh, you're probably going to do away with a lot of the beneficials. And that brings us up to the other one of the other pests I'd like to talk about, and that's uh, the cornleaf aphids. I've been getting a lot of calls about aphids and sorghum up until, you know, this week. They're mostly cornleaf aphids. And cornleaf aphids, they're really helping to feed a lot of beneficials right now. And the cornleaf aphid infestations are pretty healthy, but... They're really not going to cause any reduction in yield. They're really not going to cause any negative effect on the plant. Now, I'm sure there's a few sugarcane aphids as of last week. The furthest north I've heard of sugarcane aphids is about in Sedgwick County. They're still, you know, just kind of across the border into Kansas from Oklahoma. But I'm sure with southern breezes, we're we're getting a few, you know, into the north central part of the state, a few of the adults. And so we may see a few more of those develop, especially with the sorghum still being pretty young and with the head still haven't developed yet. If we get pretty healthy infestations of sugarcane aphids, and if we've sprayed to kill uh, the beneficials, that's not going to help our sugarcane aphid situation. Now, will folks tend to confuse the corn leaf aphid with the sugarcane aphid? They have been, Yes. You know, and they're real small. Aphids are small, so people do get confused with an aphid in sorghum. It might be the sugarcane aphid. And it might be, but right now we don't have any populations or we haven't detected any sugarcane aphid populations enough to worry about. So all the I've seen in the last two weeks are cornleaf aphids, and it doesn't pay to spray those. They're not going to have a negative impact on the plant or the yield but they are helping to feed beneficials. And there are quite a few beneficials around right now, which is good. There's quite a few lady beetle larvae and some little uh, wasps that that, uh, parasitize the aphids. So we're looking pretty good as far as beneficials go if we do get, you know, a major infestation of sugarcane aphids, which, Mm -hmm. like I said, that's that's still speculative. We don't know yet. Last year we had them, but they never did develop into much of a problem. And I'm hoping that's the same way this year but that still remains to be seen. But the beneficials won't do much for the chinch bug issue, will they? There are no really known natural enemies of chinch bugs that are going to help reduce populations, unless it's the fungus. And right now, I've seen no potential of a fungal infection or a fungus that's going to help control chinch bug populations on a large scale, none whatsoever. But that's another problem because in the last week or 10 days, we're seeing a lot of sorghum headworms. And right now, there are all different stages of sorghum headworms. The only saving grace of, about the sorghum headworm is they can only infest sorghum from about flowering to soft dough. So you have about a two-week window there when the sorghum is susceptible or vulnerable to feeding. And after that, once it gets to the soft dough, the kernel's a little bit too hard uh, for the little worms to feed on, just kind of like chinch bugs. So from flowering to soft dough. But there are all different stages of worms out there right now. So, And we've got a bunch of sorghum that hasn't started to head out yet, still in the world stage. Uh, so in the next what, two or three weeks, uh, we could still have that problem. Now, the sorghum headworm is relatively easily controlled because they're right up there in the head, feeding right exposed on the kernels. 
Insecticides kill them pretty easily. But again, if you choose to use an insecticide to control headworms, you're going to kill all the beneficials. Now, we do have pretty good data on headworms that you lose 5% yield per worm per head. 5% loss per worm per head. That's feeding on the marketable product. So, the way I, I mean, it's a difficult situation for growers. You can't not spray if you're losing 15 to 20 percent the headworms just because you might get sugarcane aphids down the road. But that's kind of the dilemma we're in right now. And that's some of the calls I've been getting. Well, should I spray or not? But, you know, it's an individual grower has to decide that. But you're, you're losing 5 percent yield per worm per head just during the flowering to soft dose stage when those worms are out there. And if if, they're, if the worms in the heads are pretty large, i.e. if they're an inch, I wouldn't spray now because they've done most of the damage. So we're just talking about if you get out and look and do the uh, what I call the bucket shake method where you shake heads in a white bucket, 10 heads here, 10 heads there, and then count the number of worms, that, that will give you your percent of infestation. That will tell you how much you're losing uh, if you don't treat. If they're small, now if they're large, they've already done most of the damage, so it's not going to pay to treat anyway. So there are a lot of variables within these decisions as far as the headworm and the chinch bugs, too. So it, it's going to be largely at the discretion of the grower. And if any producers out there have questions about their specific issues that they're seeing in their sorghum fields, they can contact you or their agricultural agent there locally can lend a hand in making those decisions. They can. They're pretty good about that. And, yeah, they can call me anytime or they can go to the... Uh, 2018 KSU Sorghum Insect Management Guides, and that will give them the insecticides that are currently labeled or registered for use against those pests and the rates and that kind of stuff. Well, Jeff, we appreciate the update from the field, and we'll have you back soon. Many thanks. Yep, my pleasure. Thank you very much, Eric. That's Jeff Whitworth on current insect issues in grain sorghum in Kansas. He is a crop entomologist with K-State Research and Extension. We'll return shortly with more. This is Agriculture Today. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Agriculture Today continues now here on the K-State Radio Network. Well, as we look to this fall, and for those of you with wheat ground still out there unattended, you probably ought to be thinking about controlling those weeds, especially in our wheat, feed grain, fallow rotation systems common in the western part of the state. And there's good reason for that, as we'll cover now with Lucas Haig joining us. He's the area agronomist, K-State Research and Extension in northwest Kansas. There's always a need for weed control, multiple reasons behind that, Lucas. One of those would be moisture conservation, at least in your region. You bet, Eric. So, you know, and, and kind of the work we're going to talk about today actually stemmed from an older study done at Tribune where uh, in, a, in an old wheat fallow system, it actually showed uh, that we could let the weeds grow after wheat harvest and, and not really hurt ourselves that much on the next wheat crop because those weeds grew some residue, captured some snow. And so then the next step of that was was looking at, okay, what if we moved to a more intensified rotation? So instead of wheat fallow, let's look at wheat corn fallow. Mm -hmm. And what's the impact of, of weed control after wheat harvest on that next corn crop? And we're talking about the timing here. That's essential to this whole equation, right? Exactly. So we're looking at, okay, what happens if we, uh, if we get those weeds under control immediately after wheat harvest, so, so basically in July, versus what if we delay weed control either out to August or do no weed control in that summer or fall period. In other words, let, let uh, that stubble grow up weedy until basically the first freeze. So that was kind of our three timings of weed control, immediately after wheat harvest, 
August control or basically no fall control. Now, for more definition, are we talking about the full spectrum of weeds, grassy weeds, as well as the broadleaf species? Yeah, correct. So there'd be a, there'd be a mix out there. So obviously, uh, uh, you know, grass species as well as you know some of our broad leaves like Palmer amaranth and uh, sometimes maybe kochia. But although if we'd done a good job of controlling that in the in the wheat crop, that likely wasn't a, a big issue. But, but yeah, both grass and and broad leaf. And the interest here is in how much moisture can be conserved in the soil available to that following corn or grain sorghum crop. And that's what you were measuring in large part in this particular study, correct? Yeah, so we, we looked at several things. We looked at how much water was in the profile at different points in time from wheat harvest all the way through the next corn crop. And then, of course, we looked at yields as well. So what's interesting is, so again, you think about it, here we are after wheat harvest, so in, in one of the set of plots, we put the herbicide down, controlled weeds, uh, basically as soon as they'd emerged after wheat harvest. And then the next timing would have been to start controlling weeds in, in August. And so when we look at how much water we had in the profile, by the time we get to August, we can already see a slight reduction on the neighborhood of about a quarter inch of water difference between our, our post-harvest weed control versus waiting until until August. Now, by the time we get out to October... And so think about this, we're there in October, we've got some plots where we've controlled the weeds immediately after wheat harvest, we've got some plots where we controlled the weeds in August, and then we've got some plots where here we are in October and and we've done yet no weed control. And by that point in time, we're seeing basically uh, almost already two inches difference of water in the soil profile between where we control the weeds after wheat harvest and where we've allowed the weeds to grow until October. So with that kind of difference in moisture retained, that automatically translates into a yield differential when you're talking about a, quote, thirsty crop like corn, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. So so that difference we've seen in October, that persisted all the way through. So at corn planting the next spring, we had captured some of that winter precip, so we had more water in the profile, but we were still seeing basically that two-inch differential, two- to three-inch differential between where we controlled weeds after wheat harvest and, and where we had allowed the weeds to grow. And then actually that extends all the way even in, into July in the growing corn crop. So at tassel silk time, uh, we still have well over an inch, inch and a half water difference between the timing of weed control clear back after wheat harvest. So not surprising, and, and this is the average across, this is the five-year study we did at Tribune, um, and there were some pretty rough corn years in there, and so our average grain yields aren't that great, but they still give you that relative idea. So, for example, across those five years, uh, where we controlled weeds immediately after wheat harvest, uh, our corn was yielding a little bit over 50 bushel. Uh, where we had let the weeds grow till August, we were kind of around that 45 bushel mark. And then when we had let the weeds grow all fall long, uh, we were picking uh, 35 bushel corn. So basically, you know, fairly substantial uh, reduction there going from where we controlled immediately after harvest to, to letting the weeds grow. have to ask, because this particular study featured corn as the crop following wheat in this rotation, grain sorghum is a little more tolerant of drier conditions, so would you suspect that we'd see a similar response on the grain sorghum side to these three weed control treatments? I would, Eric, because even though, uh, you know, we typically think of sorghum as being a little more drought tolerant, it's still a pretty responsive crop to water, and especially at those critical timings. So the fact that we've seen that difference in July in the corn at tassel silk time, well, we would have seen a similar difference, you know, at boot and heading and sorghum. And so uh, I, I think we would have seen a very similar pattern. The overall yields might have been a little bit higher for the set of years we were looking at. But again, that, that relationship between yield and water on sorghum is similar enough to corn, I I would have expected a a similar trend to emerge. And it would seem, Lucas, to go without saying that if one waits until springtime ahead of planting directly to treat, why the the hit's going to be even more severe on uh, moisture availability and subsequent yields. Certainly. I mean, the longer we allow those weeds out there to consume moisture, the the more that difference is going to show up. And the other thing I should note is, you know, we were doing this work before the era of resistant weeds. And so there's also that piece that's not just about the water consumption by those weeds, but letting stuff go to seed. And uh, when we're talking about resistant species out there, such as Palmer amaranth, that becomes a rapidly compounding problem that we weren't worrying about, you know, not that many years ago.
All right. Now, the oddity this year, in the western part of the state anyway, is that it is the, quote, garden spot. Good moisture in a fair part of that western uh, reach of the state. These principles nonetheless would still apply, would they not, even though moisture is not as tight as it usually is in that region? Yeah, I think it's especially important because, uh, as you mentioned, we've been blessed with some good precipitation out here. We've, we've been able to store that in the profile and so I think the more moisture, you know, come next spring, the more moisture we can go into that crop with, the better our yield expectations. And so it's it's really, it's still critical to let's try and keep that moisture that, that we've been so fortunate to receive. You know, and the other piece of that is, is, is a two-edged sword. You know, it's delayed folks from getting in the field and, and getting those herbicides put on. But the flip side of that is, is that moisture has also brought us a condition where we should have a nice flush uh, of that weed seed that's out there, and, and we should be able to get a higher percentage of you know, a much more effective kill on our on our first pass. And that led right into the next question, and that is, yes, optimum would have been to treat as soon as possible after harvest, but here we are in the middle part of August. It's still opportune to go ahead and carry out that control program, you're saying? Yeah, absolutely, because actually our, our biggest jump, I mean, certainly the best option was to control immediately after harvest, but from harvest to the August timing was not near as big of a jump as, as it was allowing those weeds to grow then all the way through October. And so, you know, I know we've, we've had some delays in getting things under control, but there's still a, a lot of bang for the buck to be had for getting things under control as soon as possible. Well, again, this work was well established at the Tribune Experiment Field in West Central Kansas. The applications of the data are even more broad than just that area, for sure. That is the value of controlling weeds. After wheat harvest in a wheat feed grain fallow rotation, uh, proven to be a step forward as far as retaining more soil moisture, therefore promoting better yields following that wheat. And before we let you go, just a quick side note, and this has to do with wheat directly and uh, that ground that's going back to wheat, at least in an adjacent area. Uh, the call is still out there to control that volunteer wheat, although Wheat Streak Mosaic, Lucas, was just a shadow of what it was last year. You don't want folks to let their guard down either, do you? No, that's an excellent point, Eric, and that's the other piece of timely weed control after wheat harvest is getting that volunteer wheat under control. And no, Wheat Streak Mosaic was not as big of an issue this year. Part of that was environmental, but another huge part of that was is, was uh, producers doing their best to be a good neighbor, and, and we've seen much better control of volunteer wheat this past year than we had the years prior. We've still got a ways to go, but we've got to remember that's, that's the best thing we can do to keep that level of risk down for yourself and all your neighbors is to make sure we keep that volunteer in check. And we're really at a critical time here coming into this late August, early September time period, you know, we got to have two weeks of no wheat present between the old volunteer dying and uh, the new wheat emerging. And that's that's not two weeks from the time you spray the volunteer. We need two weeks of dead uh, mm -hmm. in there. So that's that's a key point. We'd invite you to see an article in the Agronomy E-Update newsletter series. This goes back to July the 20th. It's still pertinent to the importance of post-wheat harvest weed control in dryland cropping systems, which uh, revolves around the information that Lucas has shared with us today. Lucas, as always, many thanks for your time and your input. You bet, Eric. Lucas Haig is the agronomist for K-State Research and Extension based in northwest Kansas, joining us from his office in Colby. You're listening to Agriculture Today. More is coming your way after this break over the K-State Radio Network. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Agriculture Today continues now here on the K-State Radio Network. Eric Atkinson with you. And turning to today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. 
Kansas crop conditions updated as per the weekly report from the USDA. The topsoil moisture supplies in the state as of this past Sunday were rated at 2% surplus and 58% adequate, 40% still short to very short, and subsoil moisture at 1% surplus, 57% adequate, and 42% short to very short. The condition of the Kansas corn crop this week, 47%, good to excellent, 31% fair, and 22%, poor to very poor. Corn in the dough stage now at 77%. That's ahead of the 67% for the five-year average. Corn in the dent, 42%, well ahead of the 19% average. And corn now mature in Kansas at 6%. The soybean crop condition in the state, 40% good to excellent, 38% fair, 22% poor to very poor. Soybeans blooming now at 94% ahead of the 85% average, and the soybeans setting pods at 74% well ahead of the 54% average. Grain sorghum conditions in the state, 62% good to excellent, 32% fair, 6% poor to very poor. Sorghum now heading at 72%, that's ahead of the 62% average and sorghum coloring at 15 percent ahead of the 7 percent average. As for range and pasture conditions, 31 percent good to excellent, 34 percent fair, and 35 percent poor to very poor around the state. Again, as of this past weekend, according to the USDA. The latest now on the corn and soybean crops nationally from the USDA's Gary Crawford. From a weather standpoint over this past week, you really couldn't Picture a better scenario for the Plains or for the Midwest and for the most part. Showers over the Midwest, dry heat for farmers in the Northern Plains who are harvesting small grains. This from USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey. The USDA's crop progress report pretty much backs that up nationally for the condition of the corn crop. We did see a one-point decline in the good to excellent rating to 70%, down from last week's 71%. Very poor to poor rating, steady at 10 percent. And we actually saw some one or two percent declines in the corn rated poor to very poor in some of the states with the worst rated corn, Kansas and Michigan. But Missouri dropping another point from 44 to 45 percent, very poor to poor. For soybeans, nationally 66 percent of the crop rated good to excellent, a loss of just one point during this past week. No change in the very poor to poor rating, steady at 10 percent. But Missouri, another four percent of its soybean crop falling into the poor to very poor category. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Washington. And grain sorghum nationally, 78% headed as of Sunday, ahead of the five-year average of 73%. Sorghum coloring, 37%. That's very near average. And the sorghum mature at 21%, behind the five-year average of 24%. The sorghum condition nationally at 49%, unchanged from last week. Elsewhere in the headlines, Monsanto will challenge a jury's roundup verdict in favor of a California cancer victim after the company was found liable on Friday in order to pay $289 million in damages. Groundskeeper Dwayne Johnson has non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. His attorneys allege during trial his illness was caused by glyphosate in the form of Roundup and Ranger Pro, those are both Monsanto herbicides. Monsanto Vice President Scott Partridge in a statement has said the company would continue to fight that verdict, saying the company is sympathetic to Mr. Johnson and his family. However, Partridge has noted more than 800 scientific studies and reviews in addition to conclusions from the EPA, the U.S. National Institute of Health, and other regulatory bodies around the world support the fact that glyphosate, he says, does not cause cancer. The jury award was handed down in San Francisco's Superior Court of California. That's a state court. The jury awarded $39 million in compensatory damages and $250 million in punitive damages. Now for you this week's edition of Milk Lines. Here's K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook. Mike? Today I went to visit with our Kansas dairy farmers concerning four factors that they should evaluate as they chop corn silage this fall. First thing, make sure you have that chop length set correctly. Generally we try to achieve about three quarters of an inch theoretical cut. If you're putting up shredlage where we actually tear the plant material as it goes through the chopper, you might even end up with a little bit longer chop length. But in general, the theoretical chop length should be set at about three quarters of an inch. Kernel processing then becomes very, very important. So you need to evaluate this throughout the day, probably every couple of hours while you chop, making sure that the setting remains correct. 
Easiest way to do that is to grab about a 32 ounce cup full of material every couple hours, dump it into a pail of water, take off all of the leaves and pieces of the stalk, pour out most of the water and look at the kernels that are in the bottom of the bucket. If you see some whole kernels, you need to go ahead and tighten those rolls down, making sure that you recheck after you make the adjustment to see if they've been tightened enough. Some other things to think about, as you switch fields, you need to recheck, even though it may be less than two hours since you checked before. Also, within the same field, if you switch hybrids, it's a good idea to check when you make those switches as well. Other things to be considered of is if the field has considerable variation in dry matter, in other words, the higher parts of the field are drier than the lower parts of the field, this constitutes a change in the dry matter of the forage and you need to recheck kernel processing as you go across those different parts of the field. Then the final thing to consider is also changes in plant maturity that can be associated with wet and dry as well, as well as the change in moisture that we just talked about. A couple of other things that you need to really keep track of are the inoculant that you're using. Are you using the right amount? Keep track of the tons that you're harvesting and the amount of time it takes to run through a given amount of inoculant making sure that your application rate is the same as you go through your harvest season. Also, when you're thinking about inoculant, especially during these hot days, important to keep some ice packs in with that inoculant to make sure that it stays cool throughout the day. Also, make sure you try to use up all the inoculant that you mixed up within a 24-hour period. Last thing to keep an eye on is the packing, making sure that your layers in your silo, if you're packing a bunker silo or drive over a pile, are somewhere between four and six inches in depth. No more than that. Otherwise, you'll end up with poor density. Making sure that you have enough packing tractors available for the amount of silage that is being delivered to the bunker is also very important. So kind of watch as trucks are unloading, making sure that you're able to keep up with that and still only spread layers that are four to six inches over the pile. If you're having trouble keeping up with the trucks that are dumping, you need to add another pack tractor to the process or move to another bunker and add tractors that way. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension, encouraging our Kansas dairy farmers to keep an eye on some critical factors during the silage harvest. Thanks, Mike. And we'll be back in a moment here on Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State Research and Extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. Agriculture Today continues now, and joining us once more, Wildlife Specialist Charlie Lee of K-State Research and Extension. We'll pick up on another topic in wildlife management today. Zinc phosphide, Charlie, in the spotlight here. This is a wildlife control product that's been around, and uh, there's been some interest in improving it. But give us some history on this, if you would. Well, zinc phosphide is an inorganic compound that combines phosphorus with zinc. It's used in rodenticides or rat and mouse toxicants or other animal toxicants. When the animal eats the bait, the acid in the animal's stomach turns the zinc phosphide into phosphine. And phosphine is a, is a very toxic gas. Zinc phosphide has been registered for pesticide use products since 1947. It's probably the most widely used agricultural toxicant we have. And it has a pretty good safety record. But there are some problems with it in that uh, it seems that animals develop a bait shyness because the palatability of zinc phosphide is not very good. So this was a a research report that was just published uh, earlier this year. And they looked at the zinc phosphide bait shyness and some tools to reduce the flavor aversions to zinc phosphide products. Here in Kansas, zinc phosphide seems to be used most readily for voles. There are zinc phosphide products for voles, for 13-line ground squirrels, and for kangaroo rats, and it's also widely used for prairie dog control. 
But this project uh, looked at the palatability of zinc phosphide baits with prairie voles. And voles can cause pretty extensive damage in agriculture, suburban and urban environments. So it's not just restricted to an agricultural use product. So zinc has been used more and more frequently because of some of the concerns with secondary toxicity with the anticoagulant baits. So zinc phosphide products seem to have some advantages in that secondary toxicity is not as great as it is for anticoagulants, but primary toxicity is extremely high. So it is a very toxic bait. It's very potent. Research studies have shown that zinc phosphide will kill a mouse in about 13 minutes. Just one pellet of zinc phosphide is enough toxicant to kill a bird. Many of the products' labels allow it to be used on top of the ground where it is a potential risk to birds. So I think the the summary is that zinc phosphide is not ideal as there are no toxicants that are ideal. They're developed as something to kill animals. And in order to be more efficient, we need to make sure the animals eat it when it's first put out so it's not in the environment for non-targets to consume any longer than necessary. So it's back then to that palatability problem. And they attempted to improve the taste of the product by what means? Well, this particular project looked at three different experiments. The first was to try to change the lecithin, the soy lecithin that is used as a binder in the pellets. Uh, That seems to be a product that causes poor palatability. So I think if they can leave that out, they had expected to see some greater consumption of baits. But that really didn't happen. There wasn't any difference in consumption from voles by leaving the lecithin out. So the next thing they thought would would be important would be to try to micro-encapsulate the toxicant itself. That had some success, and it looks like encapsulation can affect the rate of zinc phosphide hydrolyzing. There was some concern that perhaps it wouldn't hydrolyze quick enough to be toxic to the animals, but that was not shown to be a concern. Uh, It looks like if you use micro-encapsulated zinc phosphide, we're going to see an improvement in rodent consumption. Most of the time, rodents are going to consume more than 50% of the bait in the first day of the trials, which is good, but it could always be a little bit improved. So I think there will be continual to be work done on bait formulations and as well as ingredients in order to make some of these toxicants more effective and less risk to the environment. And you say there's yet one more hang-up with zinc phosphide that needs to be addressed. The product will deteriorate in the environment when uh, conditions are somewhat wet. Yeah, when when zinc phosphide pellets are put out in a wet environment, they start to disintegrate fairly quickly. When we have a a wet environment and using zinc phosphide, it's not nearly as effective because it seems to dissipate off uh, with the addition of moisture before rodents consume the product. But all of that said, it's still a viable rodent control method, and it'll be around for a while, it sounds. I think it's still a a product that you must consider if you're concerned with controlling uh, agricultural rodents. Again, attempts being made to improve the effectiveness of zinc phosphide as a rodent control approach. Charlie, thanks for briefing us on what is being tried out here. Charlie Lee, Wildlife Specialist, K-State Research and Extension. We have a couple of moments before wrapping things up for the day. So to let you know that coming right up are two K-State fall field days Imminently, as a matter of fact, one this evening, the other tomorrow morning. Identical programs at each of these. This evening, the Kansas River Valley Experiment Field near Rossville, hosting its fall field day, 5 o'clock sharp. On the program, integrating cover crops into one's weed management plans, covered by Anita Dilly. 
And Nathan Nelson will look at utilizing cover crops for erosion control. Also, Stu Duncan on early weed control strategies in corn and soybeans. And Ignacio C.M. Pitti on the evolution of production management practices for corn and bean crops. The Kansas River Valley Experiment Field Fall Field Day this evening at 5 o'clock. The very same program will be presented then tomorrow morning at the East Central Kansas Experiment Field just south of Ottawa. That'll begin at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning with registration and the field day at 9.30. There will be a complimentary lunch served at noon to conclude that event. Both of these field days, by the way, sponsored in part by the Kansas Corn Commission. And K-State will be hosting numerous other field days in the weeks ahead, rounding out this month of August. We'll be briefing you on those as we go along. In the meantime, thanks for tuning in today. Eric Atkinson here. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.